the problem with Scripture, when we read it like this, is oftentimes we are so in tune with the physical side of things, it keeps us from seeing the spiritual realities that God is talking about. Now, what Brian just read for us and what is all throughout uh, this chapter is a lot of talk about sexual immorality and sexual impurities and those sorts of things. Now our minds, because we are people, we are flesh and bone people, usually go to the physical act of sexual immorality, adultery, or whatever. And of course, that is to be abstained from. But what John is really talking about here, he's talking about spiritual adultery. He's talking about Christians prostituting themselves with other gods other than himself. And that's consistent all through Scripture. In the, in the Old Testament, he often refers to Israel as a harlot when Israel would get her eyes off of the true God and onto some of these other gods and things. So, uh, don't get bogged down with the physical aspects of immorality, though we certainly should avoid that. But what we're really talking about here is a spiritual immorality. And so we want to kind of keep that in mind. We're going to look this morning at the big picture. There are, there are so many details here in these two chapters, the 17 and 18, we could spend the next six months trying to identify every little feature and explain uh, every strange thing that we see in here. Uh, but I don't know that it would really do us any good uh, to know all of those things. Because oftentimes when we know all the minutiae, we, we miss the big picture. So we're going to look at the big picture this morning, at what God's trying to tell us in, in chapters 17 and 18. Now, in way of introducing us to that, I want to share with you some familiar uh, lines that we've all heard. And they are these. People are not always what they seem. Appearances can be deceiving. You cannot, and you can already finish this sentence, can't you? Judge a book by its cover. We've all heard those many times, probably uttered them many times. And they are true. So oftentimes, what looks so good, what looks so profitable for us, turns out to be just the opposite, doesn't it? I've mentioned a couple times, Sue and I kind of got hooked on this uh, show uh, called American Greed. And, and what it does, it, it chronicles uh, um, these great financial schemes that some people come up with to take your money. And what amazes me about them is the guys, that, and sometimes women, who set them up literally spend millions of dollars renting elaborate office space and that sort of thing to, to make themselves look good to investors. And maybe I just don't think large enough, but if I already had the millions to do that, why do I need to bilk millions more out of other people? I, I think I'd go fishing or something, I don't know. But it looks so good. And, and in fact, we even remark to one another, uh, well, how would you ever know where to put your money? How would you ever know who to trust? Well, the answer is you don't. The only, there's only one person you can trust, and that's Jesus Christ. And you know, <clears throat> the New Testament tells us over and over in many different ways. Uh, don't get too hung up on storing up treasures for yourself and building barns and all that sort of stuff, because it can all be gone in an instant. But Jesus endures forever. So that's where we want to put our faith and our trust and our hope is in Him. Now, while these guys on American Greed and, and other places are good, they can't hold a candle to the great imposter, can they? The father of lies. And we all know who that is. That's Satan. And I think over the years, over the centuries, uh, artists have done us a, a great disservice 
by their depictions of Satan. And, uh, you know, the, the comical one, the animated one, is the red guy with the tail and the horns and, you know, the pitchfork. And, and nobody's really afraid of him. And, and then there's all these grotesque looking renditions of Satan. And I don't know what he looks like in person. But I know that when he is dealing with us or his minions are dealing with us, when he's tempting us, it always looks good, doesn't it? It never looks evil. It never looks bad. It always, look, always looks good. And the fact, of, the fact of the matter is, sometimes it tastes good. Sometimes it feels good. Sometimes it looks like the profitable thing to do for us and sometimes for a while it is our coffers get filled. You see, Satan doesn't tempt us with ugly. He tempts us with beauty. Now there's nothing wrong with beauty. God's the original author of beauty. But we need to be discerning. We need to look beyond the cover of the book, so to speak and see where he's really coming from. Now, you know, I, I see this no more clearly than when I'm dealing with somebody, usually Christians, because non-Christians don't come to me when they're going through this sort of thing, and they've found, the husband has found another woman, or the wife has found another man. And they come up with all this stuff, and they say, well, but God doesn't want me to be unhappy. God wants me to be happy and this other person makes me happy. And besides that, it's just between us. Well, it's never just between you. Because we all live in a community of one sort or another. We all just about have children or grandchildren or parents and extended family and our church family and, and it affects every one of those people. But to the person involved, the person that's sucked in, in the moment, it feels so good. It feels so right. But we all know it's so very wrong. So today we're going to examine two of Satan's best counterfeits or deceptions. And they're going to be depicted for us as the great prostitute and Babylon, which are really two perspectives on the same thing. We'll see that as we go through. The great prostitute and Babylon the great really represent two things. The two things they represent mainly are wealth and power. Now you think about it over history, what has been the bane of this world's existence? Wealth or the desire for wealth and the desire for power. Now, is there anything inherently wrong with wealth and power? No. Wealth and power are means to ends. That's why people want wealth. That's why they want power. So if you have wealth and have power and use that wealth and that power to further God's kingdom, to alleviate suffering, to help people, that's a good thing. But so often, it is misused, isn't it? And it's like a drug. The more you have, the more you want. Which I suppose is why these guys that are already millionaires set up schemes to bilk other people out of more millions. They can't be sated. They want more and more and more. So God, throughout this book, warns his people don't buy into the system. Don't be seduced into desiring more than I have given you. Okay? Now that doesn't mean we don't try to improve ourselves. It doesn't mean we don't uh, work on getting better at things. But it means that that doesn't become all-consuming. That that doesn't come between us and God. In uh, Psalms chapter 20, verse 7, God admonishes his people and he says this, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we rest in the name of the Lord our God. And there's a song that goes along like that too. Some men trust in chariots, some trust in horses. But what's he saying? 
Is he saying horses and chariots are bad things? No, of course not. He created horses and he created people with the capacity to make chariots. Used properly, kept in perspective, very good thing. Misused, when we put our trust in those instead of him, we are eventually going to be disappointed. In Isaiah uh, chapter 31 verse 1, he uh, admonishes King Hosea, different than the Hosea in the book of Hosea, but he admonishes King Hosea not to align himself with Egypt. Egypt, as Babylon, often is used in Scripture for a place we don't want to go, for a place that's antithetical to what God has for us. But what does Hosea do? He aligns himself with Egypt. You can read it in 2 Kings uh, chapter 17. And when he aligns himself with Egypt, he alienates himself from the rising power of the day. And they invade and they wipe out Judah. Entangling alliances. You've all heard that term. Uh, as George Washington in his farewell address warned our country not to get involved in entangling alliances with Europe. Thomas Jefferson in one of his speeches during his presidency warned this country don't get involved in entangling alliances. And we listened pretty good up until World War II and what did we do? We went to war, and I think we went to war rightly so. It's just my opinion. You can throw it out. But what the mistake we made when we finished the war, we had a great victory. We didn't come home. We entangled ourselves with all of these other countries. And now, we're just sucked into this thing, and we can't figure out how to get out. Well, that's what God warns us Christians against in getting ourselves entangled with these things of the world, with this world system, with buying into it too much. He says, don't do it. Because once it's, it's, it's one of those things. It's easy to get in, but how do you get out? Okay. So he says, don't do that. Don't get entangled with Babylon. Don't get entangled with the great prostitute. Keep yourself from those things. So, before we go on, as I said, we're going to do a, a big picture thing. I want to revisit some words we read early on in this series from uh, Dr. Johnson's book. Here's what he says about details. I, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to get real detailed here. He says, abundance of detail can confuse rather than clarify. If we lack a sense of the pattern in which each piece of the puzzle has in its place. So we can have a lot of little pieces and have them all figured out, but if we don't know what the puzzle is supposed to look like, it's more confusing than it is helpful. So let's look at the big picture of chapter 17 and 18. The first thing we need to see, as we've already touched on, is evil is beautifully deceptive. Evil is beautifully deceptive. What Brian read for us. Ultimately, there are two systems of thought. The world system and God's system. Now one is very logical and at least superficially seems to make the most sense. And that's the world system. And it's not all bad until we buy into it at the expense of our relationship with God. There are some places where the world system and God's system seem to go along side by side. But the two always diverge at some point. And we have to decide which one we're going to go with. One is logical and makes good sense. The other calls us to a life of devotion and sacrifice which runs counter 
oftentimes to what seems to be in our best interest. Sometimes it runs so counter to what seems to be in our best interest, it requires our very lives, our physical lives. Do you remember in chapter 6, we heard the cry of, of who? Those who had been martyred over the years. There are thousands of people over the centuries that have literally sacrificed their lives for Jesus Christ. Now, hopefully we will never be called to do that. But you don't know. But we do know that we are called to present ourselves as what? Living sacrifices. Now, somebody has said the problem with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. <laughs> and that's kind of what we do, isn't it? We, we, we have a moment of spiritual clarity and we say, Lord, I'm going to serve you with all I've got from now on. There's no turning back. Another song we used to sing, you know. And well, we're going to do it. And then pretty soon we crawl off the altar because it gets too hard. It gets too demanding. It gets too expensive. It gets too embarrassing. It gets too whatever. And so off we go. A life of devotion and self-sacrifice is not easy. But, what did Jesus say in Luke chapter 9, verse 23? If anyone would come after me, let him what? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The first thing you have to do if you're going to follow Jesus is deny yourself. That's hard. Because what does the whole world system tell us to do? It says... Look out for yourself. Take care of yourself. Spend a little extra money on this hair stuff because you're worth it. Don't remember the name of that commercial, but you know they do that to us all the time. They show us a nice fancy car, and I lapse into coveting for a few moments, but that you can't afford, and it says, you know, you've made it now. Buy this car, so the whole world will know you made it. Okay. That's not what God calls us to do. The first system represented here by the prostitute and the mighty world power Babylon. The first thing we see about the woman though, I want you to remember Brian's, what Brian read for us. The first thing I want you to know about this woman, this prostitute, is that she is both powerful and beautiful. You see, she doesn't appear as some haggard, beat-up woman. But she appears as this beautiful person. Uh, look at verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. Now we've seen this before, haven't we? In, in a little different language. One foot on the land, one foot on the sea, this, that, and the other thing. Well, it's, it's saying that she is powerful. She has sway over the whole earth and the many waters. So she's a, a powerful woman. It's symbolic of her dominion over the world. The next thing we see is her beauty. You look at verse 4. Um, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup. Well, that sounds pretty alluring to me. And that's, you get the picture. She's adorned with beautiful clothes and things. And, and she's got this golden cup. And, and I can kind of get the picture of her holding this cup out to us. And she's saying, here, come on. Look at me. I'm powerful. I'm lovely. I have all these things. And I'm offering this golden cup to you. Well, who wouldn't take it? I hope we wouldn't. Because we didn't quite finish the verse. Holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities and sexual immorality. So what looks so good on the outside, this beautiful golden cup? 
does not look so good on the inside. I saw a movie one time, I can't remember heads or tails about it, except there was this golden cup, and when you went to drink from this golden cup, it was all full of worms. It was terrible. And that's what you got. And that's kind of the way I view this. We look at all that the world ha offers us, and how beautiful it is, and how wonderful it would be. And so we reach out and we take it. But then when we really go to drink of it, it's not so good. God says, don't entangle yourself with this woman. Keep yourself for me. Upon closer examination, we see the golden cup filled with abominations, impurities, and immoralities. Wow. Doesn't sound good, does it? Now keep your... Keep your thoughts where they, they should be now. The immoralities are straying from Jesus, straying from our first love, running to other gods rather than to the one true God. And this woman has a name. Verse 5, And on her forehead was written the name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes, and of earth's abominations. So we see that they're one and the same, though they're a little different perspective, a little different view, they are one and the same. Well, why Babylon? Because throughout Scripture, Babylon has been used, as Egypt often is, for the place we don't want to go, for the kingdom we fight against. And who was it, by the way, we talked about the, the reigning world power who came in and destroyed Judah because Hosea made an alliance with Egypt? Who was that power? <coughs> Babylon. It was Babylon that destroyed Judah. It was Babylon that destroyed God's temple. Okay. So it's a Babylon is, is a, a real pregnant word in Scripture, if you will. It's just full of meaning. <coughs> Mostly not good. We could say this, that the spirit of Babylon is Antichrist. Okay? Now we've, we've learned as we've gone along, Antichrist isn't just one person that's going to be revealed somewhere down the, down the line. We've gone through all of that. Antichrist is the spirit of anything that is Antichrist. Babylon is totally Antichrist. The world system is Antichristian. We, we know that, don't we? Because we all watch the news, you can marvel. The only people anymore you can uh, openly degrade and put down without getting censured for it is Christians. And you can beat them up all day long. And it's fine. Why is that? Because the world we live in is run by Babylon. We should remind ourselves now of our time period. We're in the first century, correct? John's writing this in the first century. Well, what would Babylon have meant to the churches that he wrote to? You remember he's writing to seven specific churches, very real places, the real people. What would they have thought of when he said Babylon? Well, let's look in verse 9. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. Now, that may not mean a whole lot to us, but if we were first century Christians, we would know immediately where he was talking about. Because what great city sits on seven mountains? We would call them hills in the northwest, but other places are called mountains. Rome, exactly. The city of the seven hills. They would have known immediately. Oh, he's talking about Rome. Because you see, Babylon, the spirit of Babylon, takes on different specific physical names as we go along. But it's always present. John warns us in, in 1 John about Antichrist. He says there are many Antichrists and they're, they're always with us. So Babylon 
has morphed into Rome now as far as uh, these Christians would be thinking. They would recognize it as Rome immediately. And they might wonder, how can this be? If Rome is so bad, why does she look so good? Rome was a beautiful place. If Rome is so strong, how can she ever fall? And Rome did look good. And Rome was the most powerful nation on the earth. And what does Rome amount to today? Physical Rome? Geographical Rome? Not much in the world scheme of things. It's a nice place for tourists to go or people like me that like old stuff and we can go look at it. It's cool. But that's about it. Well, the Vatican's there. You know, you know. But it's not... Does it have a, is it a world power? No. No. So over the years, Babylon's rise and fall. So what this might, might this look like to a 21st century Christian? We could say, well, America is so good, how can she be bad? Or we could say, America is so strong. We are the only superpower, real superpower, you know. How can she ever fall? Okay. Now, I'm as patriotic as the next guy, okay? Probably more so than most. And I'm conservative in my politics, if you haven't figured that out yet. I love our country. I love what Ann did here. It's beautiful. But that's not where I'm going to put my hope for my salvation. My hope is going to lie in Jesus Christ. Because this country can be gone tomorrow. We don't know. The only thing we know for sure is... Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. That's where we want to lodge our hope. <clears throat> then, conversely, we might look around and we see the church. And we could say, how can the church possibly survive? The church looks so weak. The church looks so powerless. How can you stand up there and say that the church is going to go on forever and these kingdoms are going to rise and fall and come and go? Because of a couple of things. One, a familiar verse for us by now, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. They've asked God, how are they going to overcome? And he says this. Not by, not by might, nor by power, but by my word, says the Lord, or my spirit, says the Lord, depending on your translation. That's why the church will endure. It won't be mighty in men's eyes. It won't be powerful in men's eyes. But it will be in God's eyes. And he fills it with his power. Matthew 16, 8 is the other reason. Jesus is speaking, and what does he say? He says, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We have a promise from God himself, Jesus Christ, that he's going to build his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I, th I don't think we need any more than that. So, so where does it make sense to lodge your hope? I think it makes sense to lodge it in the church, in Jesus Christ. Well, the second thing here is God's word is beautifully true. In chapter 18, we see the fall of Babylon. We see ultimately what is going to, what's going to become of it. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great! 
She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. My, how the mighty have fallen. Not very good for Babylon now, is it? I think they have a problem. And their biggest problem is in verse 5. God says this, For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and here it is, and God has remembered her iniquities. Man, think about that. I don't think any of us here can hold a candle to the spirit of Babylon as far as doing bad things, doing evil, well, loving evil in our hearts. But I would, I would just ask you the question, how would you like to stand before God, which we all will someday, and have him remember your iniquities? Would you have a chance? No. No. But he's going to remember Babylon's iniquity. He tells us in Jeremiah chapter 31 that he will remember our sins no more. Verse 34. See? That's our hope. Because of Jesus Christ, when we stand before God, he's going to remember our sins no more. Boy, that's a contrast to what the unbeliever is going to have to deal with. You see, God's word is not only beautifully true, God's word is tragically true. If you're an unbeliever, it's tragically true for you, as it is beautifully true for the believer. And then if you read through chapter 18, you see that he gets pretty specific about things. And it, jump over to verse 22 with me. I'll just read a little bit of what he says here. He says, So Babylon, I'm at, actually in 21, So Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters, will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of a bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. Well, what's he saying? It looks to me like he's saying just about everything that brings pleasure is going to be no more. Everything you bought into to fill your life is going to be no more. How tragic is that? No music. No joy. No craftsman. Isn't that interesting? Why did he throw that in there? Well, as a fellow by the name of G.K. Beale. He's at Westminster Theological Seminary. And he makes this suggestion. Now, when you're reading books about the book of Revelation, words like suggestion are always good to note because what that tells me is that tells me I'm dealing with an honest author because he knows he might be wrong because we're dealing with things that we, a lot of times we can't really nail down. So I love it when they're honest. And just and tell you, but here's what he suggests, the reason for the word craftsman. And if you were here when we went through the seven churches, uh, this will, will uh, resonate with you, I think. He suggests that it may be in retribution for the ostracism of Christians from the trade guilds in the Roman Empire. You remember in some of the churches, if, if you didn't swear allegiance to the, the local deity, you couldn't belong to certain trade guilds. Okay, God, it's, it's, it's just a little irony here. God saying, okay, you guys wanted to ostracize the Christians from your trade guilds. We won't have any more trade guilds. There won't be any more craftsmen. I don't know. It's worth thinking about. No mill 
Well, what could that mean? Well, to a first century Christian, that would mean starvation. No mill to grind the wheat, that's not a good thing. That equals no food. No lamp. He's saying there's going to be no spiritual light. Think about what the world will be like, and there is going to be a time, we're, we're just almost right there now, in, in our study here, when God's going to release evil and we're going to be able to see it for what it really is. And I hope we're gone by then. But I don't know. But no, no light. Think about it. As evil as men and women are today, as brutally as we treat one another sometimes today, when we have this, all this restraining light from God, what would it be like without that light? Not very good, I would not think. And, and finally here he says, there will be no voice of the bridegroom and the bride. Well, who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Who's the bride? The church. And what are we doing now? We're calling men and women to come to Jesus Christ. But evidently there's going to be a time when he stops calling men and women. And I don't know when that time's going to be. So if he's calling you, I would implore you to answer that call and give your life to Christ now. But for those who belong to God, for those who are sealed by the Holy Spirit, there will be a different response. And we find that in verse 20. Rejoice over her, her being Babylon. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. So there's two responses, isn't there? By two different groups of people. We've seen that before, haven't we? That's becoming a familiar theme to us. For Christians, for those who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the demise of Babylon is going to me mean the ushering in in full of God's kingdom. And we're going to rejoice because the king will be amongst us. So what? So what difference does it make? It makes all the difference in the world. Because we keep coming back to this same theme. The theme of twos, I've decided to call it. For lack of a better, a more eloquent way. But we always have, from the beginning of this book to the end of this book, two peoples, don't we? We have God's people and not God's people. Or, as Revelation tends to call them, those who dwell upon the earth. We have God's people and those who dwell upon the earth. And from those two peoples always come two responses to God's message. It's either yes or it's no. They either respond to God's message or they don't. It's so much foolishness to them.